All right, well, hello, everybody. My name is Professor Thomas, and I'm going to be your instructor for the semester. And physiology is a very interesting course because anatomy is where you learn about the structures of things. Physiology is you learn how the structures in our body work to help us survive. And I tell my students on the first day, and it's a bit interesting today because this is a online course and I'll be mainly interacting with you through videos, but physiology is really about two things. One is concentration gradients and two, surface area development. Because it's amazing how we are one individual. However, we're made up of basically 60 trillion tiny units called cells. Meanwhile, these cells are bathed in water, and these cells, all 60 trillion of these cells, get nutrients from a part of our body called the blood. And I didn't label that, so I'm going to go ahead and label that here. So right now, your cells are going through untold processes, millions of processes. And to do so, they need a source of nutrients, and they need something that's going to eliminate wastes. <clears throat> so first, just to kind of clarify for you, three systems in the, or three parts of the body that transport nutrients, blood, then it travels through the interstitial space, then it goes to the intracellular em environment, and waste products go reverse. So think of the intracellular space, think of this as the buffer zone between the blood and the intracellular space. And the blood is very important because the blood is very similar to a transport system or a freeway system in our society. It is how our cells get everything that they need. Let's just talk, and normally this would be the part where I ask the students to volunteer what are some things that are carried through our blood? Can't really do that now, so I'll go ahead and just uh, throw it at you. And the first thing is going to be oxygen. So oxygen, or O2, is carried through the blood. That is something we'll talk about later on this semester. It is a type of protein called hemoglobin. And oxygen is very important because it needs to actually go to our cells. So it travels through the blood, through the intracellular space, and into the intracellular environment. And as I said, we have about 60 trillion cells. Okay. Now what else is, is, tra is transported through the blood? Well, we have nutrients. Think about the last meal you ate. What happened to it? Well, what happened is that, is that whatever you ate went down your esophagus into a giant bag called the stomach, and the stomach used a bunch of corrosive acids and enzymes to basically break down this food into a ball of mush. As the ball of mush traveled through your intestines, it was more or less liquefied and absorbed into your blood. So every nutrient that you take in is going to be transported through your blood. Except for fats, they go through a slightly different system, but we'll cover that when the time comes. So nutrients travel through your blood and they also get into your cells. Now there are some other things that are very important to get into your blood as well. Ions, also known as charged atoms and charged molecules. So we have ions. They're also very important to go into your cells. You probably know that there are some popular drinks that have these ions, which I guess I guess the buzz term is electrolytes. Gatorade, for example, even though it's largely sugar, unless you buy the low sugar versions, so that Gatorade is full of ions that your cells need for activity, like sodium, potassium, so on and so forth. So those are just some examples of things that, that 
are transported through our blood that go into our cells. It's very important that our cells have a constant supply of these nutrients because cells are very energy hungry things, especially the cells in our brain called neurons. And if they don't get enough oxygen, nutrients, and ions, then some of the times they just turn off. Neurons in the brain, they do not do well with being deprived of their essentials. And if that's the case, somebody can lose consciousness really fast if their blood is not circulating at the, at the correct speed. Which, how fast does, does blood circulate throughout the body? Uh, the equivalent of about four miles an hour, uh, uh, give or take. So it's traveling through a pretty good, good speed. And it, and it needs to, to innervate all 60 trillion of our, of our cells. Now, our cells are also extremely um, liberal about how, how they dispense their waste. And cells, they are currently undergoing millions of metabolic reactions. And what they are going to do is they are going to take their metabolic waste products and they are going to return them to the blood. So examples here will be metabolic waste products. And these are extremely numerous, I'm not going to go into them all. And these also go from the cells through the interstitial space to the blood. Because one thing to keep in mind is that Water is the main transport medium in our body. You cannot have transport through thin air. Everything has to travel through water, which is why our body is bathed in water. If it was not, we could not transport. And another metabolic waste product is going to be carbon dioxide, or CO2 as it's, as it's called. CO2 is also going to be dumped into our blood. And then our body has to deal with that because CO2, as we'll talk about later on this semester, is not good for long periods of time in the blood. It actually, not to spoil it, but it, carbon dioxide reacts strongly with water to form acidic products. All right, so let me just look at the outline and make sure that I covered everything for you guys. And by the way, you're probably curious about my, about my shirt. I am a full-time teacher at a high school called La Reina High School. It's a small all-girls all school in Thousand Oaks. And they've been nice enough this summer to let me come in and use, my, use this classroom for our recordings. So I will be giving you a mix of lectures in my classroom here. But also I have a drawing tablet at, at home. So sometimes you'll also get a lecture delivered through one of my um, my, uh, my drawing tablet. So it will be a mix of those two. All right, so that is our recap. Three environments in the body, blood, the interstitial space, and, and the intracellular environment. The idea is, is that blood gives nutrients and essentials to our cells, and then our cells take their waste products and put them into our blood, and then it is expelled from the body in one form or another. All right, well, if you have any, any questions, this is just a reminder that I will be online for office hours, 5.30 to about 6.30ish from Monday through Thursday. All right, this is part one of uh, chapter five, and the next part is going to be the cellular membrane uh, function. Okay, everybody, well, welcome back. So now we're on the next part of our outline, which is going to be the cell membrane, its properties, and why it's so important that we learn it. Well, as I said, is that we are made up of 60 trillion cells that are constantly transporting things. Think of a cell as a busy shopping center sorry, a busy indoor mall or a Costco. The people going in represents all the things going into the cell. People going out, they represent all the, all the things going out of the cell. So things are constantly moving in and out of the cell. And what's interesting about the cell is that animal cells, at least, 
are made up of something called a phospholipid cell bilayer. In fact, if you remember from your introductory biology class, is it's called a semi-permeable membrane. So I'm going to write this on top here. Actually, I'll do it off to the side so it doesn't get in the way. Semi-permeable membrane. So we know that semi means kind of, and we know permeable means pass through. So this means that this, this membrane, things can kind of pass through it, which is right. Because there are certain things that can go into the cell and out of the cell without, without any impediment. And, there, and, and then there's things that actually cannot freely move, move through the cell, so they need some help. So first of all, let's talk about some things that can just freely go inside the cell. Well, actually, before we do that, let's talk about what gives the cell membrane its semi-permeable properties uh, to begin with. Now, as you see here, I only drew one part of, of how the cell membrane looks because it would take a while to do this entire thing. But if you look here, it looks like I drew some circles on the top of the cell membrane and on the inside. And that's because these heads here, called glycerol heads, they actually are exposed to any environment that has that is made up of water, which is everything. And that's because these heads are what we call hydrophilic, meaning that the heads, they are able to exist in water. But what's interesting is that these heads make up one half of what is called a phospholipid. So I'm going to write this on top here, phospholipid. And a phospholipid is the building block of the animal cell membrane. So what happens here is that the top part of it is a type of carbohydrate called glycerol, and the bottom part is made up of fatty acid tails. And what's interesting is that these fatty acid tails are what we call hydrophobic, meaning they do not get along well with water. And if any of you have done that experiment where you've mixed oil and water, you'll see that they don't mix. You'll see that water really does not pass through lipids easily. So because of that, let's say you were to take a handful of phospholipids and throw them into water. They would automatically arrange in a shape very similar to this. They would arrange so that the tails are hidden from the water, but that the heads are ex exposed. So therefore, you can almost compare the phospholipid membrane to a, to, a, to a hamburger, is that the bun on each side is kind of like the glycerol heads, and all the stuff in the, the middle is, is like the hydrophobic tails. Now, because of that, there are some things that can freely pass through and some things that cannot freely pass, pass through. And by the way, we'll talk about this in a bit, but this is called simple diffusion. So let's, let's talk about first things that can pass through easily without any impediment. So I'm going to put over here, let me make sure the camera, yeah, yeah, you guys can see this. So the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be freely permeable. Freely permeable, meaning that these are things that can pass through the cell membrane without anything stopping them. And the first thing is going to be gases. Gases can freely pass through the cell membrane. Other than that, we can have things called small, nonpolar molecules. These are very small molecules that are nonpolar. And how they work is that they can actually sneak in between the glycerol heads and only interact with the hydrophobic tails. They're that small. And things that are small, small hydrophobic molecules are mainly steroids, so steroid hormones, but also many pharmaceuticals are designed in order to be very small and nonpolar. They can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So examples of these are going to be steroid hormones. 
Um, now, water is a tricky one. And I say that water is tricky because if you were to leave water and fat together for a long enough period of time, some water can sneak through, but it is very slow. So water can, just because of water's properties, water can freely diffuse through the cell membrane. It would just take a very long time. And water, as we know, water needs to, to get into the cells. They can do so with water channels. We'll talk about what a, what a channel is in a, in a second. But they can actually get through water channels that are always open called aquaporins. So I like to put down that water is freely permeable, but I kind of put an asterisk by it because yes, it is freely permeable, but at the same time, it's not classically permeable. So I'm gonna go ahead and put water here with an asterisk. Okay, now what cannot pass through the cell membrane? Um, everything else. Now, this doesn't mean that they can't get in or out of the cell. It just means that if they were to try and, and go through the cell membrane, they could not. They need help. They can get help for something that's called a protein transporter that we'll talk about. But on their own, they cannot freely pass through. Some examples of that, so I'm going to put here, impermeable. And the first thing that is impermeable is going to be ion. Anything charged cannot pass through the cell membrane on its own. Ions also need channel protein that we'll talk about. Large polar molecules. Proteins, for example, sugars. Um, those are things that cannot freely pass through. They can, but they need something called a carrier, a protein carrier. And we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. So ions, large polar molecules, basically anything large. I know that sounds, uh, I know that sounds kind of obvious, but things, things that are very large cannot freely move, move through the cell membrane. They have a separate method of doing so called endocytosis, meaning inside the cell. But those are things that are impermeable to the cell membrane. All right, now there are other things on top of the cell membrane. And one thing I'm going to draw here is going to be transporters. So these are called transporters, and there's a couple of them This is called a channel protein. So what these, these are is that they're proteins that actually go through the entire width of the cell, meaning they expand from one side to the other. And I guess an example would, would be a tunnel in a, in a mountain. You, you cannot pass through a mountain unless there's a tunnel there. Well, it's the same thing in the cell, except in the cell it's called a channel. So the, so the channel goes through the cell membrane and it allows for a specific type of uh, molecule to pass through. So not just any molecule, it has to be a specific one. Like there's channels for sodium ions, there's channels for potassium ions, there's channels for water. So channels have to be specific. So let me erase this part of the cell membrane here. We also have something called a carrier. And carriers, what these do is they're kind of like escorts. What they do is that a very large molecule needs to be escorted from one side of the cell to the other. It isn't just a channel that opens up and does and does such a through. This actually has to carry along the the product to go from one side of the cell to the other. 
And carriers have very large things. They transport large things like protein, sugars. So channels deal with, with um, smaller types of, of molecules where carriers move through larger things. Think of it like an aircraft carrier, very, very large, transports very large things. What carrier, um, uh, what carrier proteins are very similar is they transport in very large things. Like an example of a carrier protein would be the glute transporter. What it, what it does is it transports glucose from one side of the cell membrane to the other. So these are the two um, uh, types of protein transporters we're going to talk about. The next thing that's on the cell surface, let me make sure I'm going in line with the enzymes. So we don't talk about these too much, but there's actually types of proteins on the cell surface called enzymes. And if you remember, what enzymes do is they catalyze chemical reactions, meaning that they actually allow chemical reactions to happen faster. So I'm just going to draw an example here. This here will be an enzyme. As I said, we'll go over specific e examples as the semester progresses. But enzymes are responsible for catalyzing chemical reactions. Now the next thing, and this is something very important, is cell communication proteins called receptors. So draw this over here. This is a special type of receptor called a G-protein coupled receptor, but it's a receptor. What receptors do is that they receive specific molecules that instruct the cell to do something. This is the way that our cells, cells communicate. For example, our cardiac muscle has receptors for a hormone called epinephrine. What this hormone does is it binds with the receptor that's on the cell. It's called a beta-1 receptor. And it tells the, the cardiac tissue to contract harder and faster. Now, it's not actually giving the cell anything new. It's just it's telling it something. So receptors is how hormones and other signaling molecules um, can go from one cell to another and tell it to do a job. But Receptors receive specific signaling molecules. Not all cells have the same receptors. So receptors are, are how cells, cells communicate with each other. Um, next we have something called ad, adhesion proteins. And I'll just draw these. Let's see, I'll go ahead and use black. For this adhesion proteins, what they do is they anchor one cell to another. So let me just draw kind of a cell here, tiny cell here, so you can kind of see how, how it works. So what it does is we know that tissues are made up of cells. However, as you learned about in anatomy, if you're going to look at a cell that's under or, or tissue that's that's underneath neath the microscope, you'll see that all the cells are very closely packed together. And that's because they're held together with these adhesion proteins. What they do is that they make the cells continuous with one another. Now, this might seem kind of hard to comprehend because throughout all of your lives, every time you've seen a cell in a textbook, it's been a random circle looking thing with a bunch of stuff packed inside. Well, I am here to tell you that that is really only a teaching model. A cell like that does not exist. There's actually not there's more cells than not that are that are bound to bound to together than cells that are just free free floating around. So cells are stuck to together with adhesion proteins. For example, our skin is made up of a bunch of types of cells called keratinocytes. Of course, the ones on, on the epidermis, the very top, are dead, but they're all anchored together with these adhesion proteins to keep them continuous. And that's why our, why our skin is such a good barrier from anything um, 
from the outside environment getting into our to our uh, our our inside environment. Okay, and also cells actually have things on them that act as identifiers, mainly sugar patterns. If you look at most cells underneath a very very powerful microscope, you'll see that there's a, a bunch of almost looks like almost cotton candy ish on on top. And there's a bunch of proteins and carbohydrate patterns. So cells also have on them identifiers. These identifiers are important because our immune system, when we are born, the, the immune system has to learn what belongs in our body and what doesn't belong in our, in our body. And it does so by learning what type of identifiers are present on our cells. That's why if you have type A blood, that means you have blood that have A proteins on them. Your immune system learns that these cells um, with the A proteins are your blood cells. If you get blood cells that have a B protein on them, your immune system will identify that B protein as being foreign. Even though that B protein serves no threat to your body, your immune system does not know that. So it will, it, will, will, it will trigger an oftentimes fatal immune response. So identifiers help our cells identify what belongs and what doesn't. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap this. Let me make sure we have everything here. It looks like we do. So our cells are made up of something called phospholipids. These are very... Um, these are, are, are very basic building blocks. They're not cells. It is just a head of something called, called glycerol, attached to fatty acid tails, and they actually make up the cell membrane. I don't think I mentioned this, but the advantage of it is that it gives our cells a lot of flexibility as far as our shape goes. If you poke yourself, you're, you're slightly deforming your cells, but that's okay because these cells made up of phospholipids are designed to bend a bit. So, so we know that these, this phospholipid membrane gives our cells some properties as far as allowing things to either enter or exit. I did put over here uh, so some things that can pass through, but things that can pass through are going to be gases, small nonpolar molecules, and to an extent water. Things that are impermeable are ions, large polar molecules, and basically anything large in general. We know that our cell membrane is embedded with many things, such as receptors, which is how cells receive signals from other cells. And as I said, this tells the cell how to modify its behavior. We also have transporters in the form of channels and carriers. And carriers, they transport large things, while channels allow small things to pass through. And I didn't mention this, but channels can also be gated meaning that they basically can open and, and close based on certain stimuli. So channels can also have gates that allow them to be open and closed. Water channels do not have gates, but things like sodium channels, potassium ions, they do have gates. We also know that our cells have identifiers on them, so the immune system can identify what belongs and what, what doesn't. They also serve many other purposes. And there's also enzymes in the cell surfaces that catalyze chemical reactions. All right, well, this is the end of part two of our chapter five discussion. Next is going to be something that is always a treat with, uh, with my classes, and that is osmosis and then diffusion. All right, over and out. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to our continuance of chapter five. So earlier, I gave you some lessons from the classroom. Today, you get a lesson from the green room. I'm currently visiting my parents, and when I do so, I give my lectures from the green room, also known as the room that nobody else wanted. So it's turned into my pseudo office. And yeah, that explains why the room is very green. But anyways, that's not super important right now, but to keep with the theme, I will draw an apparatus in green. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an apparatus here, as straight lines as I can muster. And this apparatus is going to be separated down the center. I'll go down the center as much as possible by a semi-permeable membrane, just like a cell. So what this apparatus is designed to do, it is designed to simulate two separate em environments separated by a cell membrane. We're not really using any physiological examples right now. Right now, we're just looking at the rates of water movement because we're going to be talking about a process called osmosis. And it is defined on the outline, but just to give you a, another succinct definition, it is movement of water, movement of water from, and let's keep it simpler, toward a more concentrated environment. So basically, if you have an environment separated by a semi-permeable membrane, water will move toward the side of the membrane that is more concentrated. And let's go ahead and define that too. What is a concentration gradient? So concentration gradient That is going to be difference in solute concentration between two sides. Abbreviate between here, between two sides. So what I'm going to do is in one environment here, I'm going to put pure H2O. Pure H2O has an osmolarity of zero, by the way. And on the other side, I'm going to have three moles, what we call milliosmoles. And I'll put in a non-penetrating solute, as we call it, glucose. You're probably saying, well, what do you mean by three milliosmoles of glucose? Well, what I mean is that is the osmolarity of the solution. So let's go ahead and define that quickly. What is osmolarity? Osmolarity. It is the number, more or less, of non-penetrating solutes, meaning they cannot go through the cell membrane, over the equivalent of one liter of a solvent, which in this case is going to be water. So the number of non-penetrating solutes in a given amount of water, in this case, it will be one liter. We do that to find out the osmolarity of these, of these solutions. So we see here that the concentration gradient is pretty significant between the two sides. And of course, I'm doing that to illustrate the concept of osmosis. Now, how it works is that, is that water wants to reach equality between the two sides, meaning that water wants to be the unequal concentrations between two sides. And even if it can't do so, it certainly is going to try. So what's going to happen is that with us, with us osmosis, water always goes toward the more concentrated solution. So in this case here, H2O moves toward more concentrated side. 
very exactly what I wrote up, wrote up here actually. So the pure water is going to attempt to go into the area that has a higher concentration of non-penetrating solutes. So we'll see that a significant amount of water is going to try to go from the pure H2O side to the, to the environment that has the three milliosmoles of, of glucose. Because glucose cannot pass through the cell membrane, as I talked about last lecture. And as I talked about a bit earlier, the greater the, the concentration difference, then the greater the movement of water toward the more concentrated side. And just to make things a little bit more, more visible, I'll use this nice teal color, also keeping with the theme of green, to, to simulate the solutes in the, in the uh, solution. Now, let's say I were to tamper with this a bit. Let's say that I were to, I'll just, I'll just give you some examples for fun. I'll call this side B, I'll call this side A. Let's say instead I'm going to put in three moles, three milliosmoles of sodium. Hmm. Well, would the constant, would the movement of os osmosis change? And the answer is yes, it would. What would happen is that water would not move at all. And that's because with osmosis, we're not concerned with what the solutes are. We're concerned with the concentrations. So in this case, there would be no water movement. because the osmolarity is the same on each side. Recall that osmolarity is the number of non-penetrating solutes over one liter of water. Does not matter what those solutes are. So if the osmolarity is the same between two sides, water is not going to move. All right, let's go back to our, our starting ex experiment. So we're gonna erase this, go back to pure H2O. excuse me, as I reset this. When you do your PhysioX activity, you can just easily reset the apparatus, but not in Professor Thomas's lecture, not that fancy. All right, now we use some terms to describe the difference in solute concentration between each side. And it is called os osmolarity. So we have some, some terms here to talk about when we compare the osmolarity between two environments. So I'll just call this comparing osmolarity. Now the first term is going to be hypoosmotic. This side has less solutes. Now we also have a term called hyperosmotic. And as you imagine, that means more solutes. And the third one is going to be called isoosmotic. And this means same solutes. One thing to, to note though, is that only one side can, can, uh, can be, for example, hypoosmotic. Because if one side is hypoosmotic, the other must be hyperosmotic. And both sides need to be isoosmotic. So what I would like you to do now is I'm going to ask you a question of the day. So if you go to the discussion board, you'll see something that says um, chapter five, question of the day one. I would like you to complete that now. And you can do that by pausing this lecture, answering it, and then, then coming back. But the, the question for you is, is list the osmolarity of each of these sides. Is side A, hyperosmotic, 
is side B hypoosmotic? Are both these sides isoosmotic? So let's go ahead and put down in the answer, A is whatever osmolarity you think it is, B is whatever os osmolarity you think it is. So go ahead and pause this and then come back. Okay, well, I hope you did pause it and not just wait for me to tell you the answers and then complete it on the dis discussion board. As I said before, is that you are given points for mostly correct answers. As long as you give the, give the, uh, the, the question an, an honest effort, you'll get full points. But I know that some students do not want to give an honest effort. They just want to put down, I don't know, or something like that kind of hard to give points to that. So as long as you've given honest effort, then I'll be a happy teacher. But anyway, side A, which has fewer solutes, this is going to be hypoosmotic. And side B that has more solutes is going to be hyperosmotic. Hyper means too much, hypo means not enough. So this side has too much solutes, this side has not enough solutes, therefore water is going to go to the hyperosmotic side. Now, if both these environments had the same osmolarity, they both would be isoosmotic. All right, great. So that is our quick dis discussion on osmolarity, but now we need to All right, so we just talked about osmolarity and how that works. And now we're going to talk about a closely related term called tonicity, which is very important because now we're going to be switching more to the physiology side of this. Because with, with, with tonicity, the very term means pertaining to cell size or shape. And this is in, uh, and when we, we talk about tonicity, we talk about it in terms of the solution that these cells are in. So I'm gonna tell you a, a, a quick story that I, I learned, and this is kind of talked about in your case study as well but there was something called water poisoning. And it was common in the early to mid 1900s, at least that's, that's when it was most documented, is that athletes would begin to show symptoms of, give me one moment, my screen sharing is pause for whatever reason. Ah, oh, here we go is that athletes would, would begin to show symptoms of something called, um, of symptoms of what appeared to be heat stroke. And what they would do is that, to help them with this, is they would give them more water, which unfortunately um, made their, their condition worse. And in several uh, circumstances, these people died. And they called this water toxicity because they learned what happened is that when somebody, um, when someone exercises vigorously, their, the ions that are contained in their, in their blood actually go to the, the surface of their, of their skin to become sweat. So actually um, plasma in their, in their blood actually goes through their sweat glands and becomes sweat. And of course, when that happens, it brings ions with it, and the blood becomes more, di di more dilute. So what happened is that these, these people were, were showing symptoms um, that were caused by their blood becoming too dilute. Since their blood was, more di was, was becoming more and more dilute, what would happen is that water would go from their... Um, from the blood into their cells. Because recall that the movement of osmosis goes from a low concentration of solutes to a high concentration of solutes. Water would move from the blood into the cells. The cells would expand, they would, they would um, swell, and this led to a lot of 
of uh, very unfortunate consequences because neurons, cells in the brain, when this would happen with neurons is that the neurons would begin to, ex to expand, increasing um, what we call intracranial pressure because the neurons would, ex would expand in size, but the cranium cannot expand in turn. So what happened is that this pressure on the brain caused irreversible brain damage. And that, of course, was the last stage of water toxicity. So we, our, our body normally does, does a very good job of maintaining um, what we call an isotonic solution. And to show you that, I'm going to use a sample here, a cell called an erythrocyte, also known as a red blood cell. And this cell has about 250 milliosmoles of solutes inside. Now you're probably saying, well, what are those solutes? And can, they, and can they leave? The answer is no. Is the solutes are mainly things that comprise the red blood cell's mass, like lots of uh, hemoglobin protein. So this cell is always going to have about 250 milliosmoles of stuff in it. And this, this pretend beaker that I drew is going, going to represent the outside environment. And under, under normal circumstances, it's going to have a very similar osmolarity. But in this case, we are going to refer to the concentration of the outside solution as tonicity, because tonicity pertains to cell size or shape, depending on this number here, will determine whether or not the cell is going to gain or lose water and thus change shape. So in this case here, we see that the concentration between the inside environment and the outside environment is the same. So we're going to say that this is an isotonic solution. Because of that, water is going to enter the cell, but it's also going to leave the cell. Because water doesn't stay still. It's going to be constantly moving in and out of the cell. Because of that, the water's the cell is neither going to gain nor lose water. It's going to be equal. And because of that, we are, are going to say that this cell is going to stay the same size. So there will be no change in cell size. Um, our systematic body cells want to be in an isotonic solution, but there are times when we actually do want a concentration gradient. Like when we talk about the renal system, you'll see how, how it's imperative that the environments are not the same, same concentration. But that will be much later on. Well, not much, it's a pretty short semester, maybe like a month from now. All right, now what about if we're, if we're gonna slightly change things? So I'm gonna go back in time here. And instead, I'm going to make the concentration of the outside environment, I'm going to make this instead, um, give me one moment here, my Zoom settings got mixed up. Okay, cool. I'm going to make this now in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic meaning not enough. So what has happened here is that the outside solution has fewer solutes than the inside of the cell. Well, what's going to happen is that water is going to enter the cell. Because recall, water goes from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. The greater the difference between these two numbers, the greater the rate of water, water movement, a pretty significant difference. So in dotted lines, I'm going to draw how the cell will change size and we'll see that the cell is actually going to become bigger, going to become swollen. And if the cell increases in size too much, it will just burst. Okay, so in a hypotonic solution, water will enter the cell and the cell will increase in size. All right, so this is now, going smaller, 
And now we are going to once again change the experiment. And now we're going to put the cell in a hyper tonic environment. So it's going to be hypertonic. Let's go ahead and make this number something nice and simple 400. What's going to happen now is that the, the, uh, the extracellular environment is going to become more concentrated. And this can happen in things such as um, dehy dehydration, water is lost, but the solutes stay the same, so osmolarity of the outside solution goes up. Water will leave the cell. What will happen is that the cell is going to shrink. So I'll draw this in dots, how the cell will change size. The cell will shrink because water is going from the cell into the outside solution. And this has just as much of a detrimental effect, physiologically speaking. So we don't want our cells to change size too much. But, but the renal system, in amazing system, usually does a very good job of keeping those, those concentrations the same, keeping osmolarity the same between the two sides. All right, so now we are going to talk about a concept called diffusion. And diffusion is a bit different than osmosis because osmosis assumes that, all right, you have, you have two environments. One or more of the environments has a non-penetrating solute. So water is going to move to equalize the amount of water on each side. Diffusion is different. So with, with diffusion, water will not move because the solutes are able to diffuse. So diffusion is molecular movement from a high to low concentration. Now there are several small experiments you can do. One experiment you can do is take Fib Febreze and, and you can spray it on one side of your, of your room. I would do it in here, but this room is very small, so I will be getting a huge whiff of Fib Febreze in no time flat. But if, if you have a large house or a large, large kitchen, go on one side, spray some Fib Febreze, and then go to, to, to the other side of the room, and in a couple of seconds or minutes, you will begin to smell the fib, fib breeze. Because, because what happens with, with diffusion, I'll go ahead and draw a room here. So this is a room. And let's say somebody sprays fib breeze on this side of the room here. I'll do fib breeze in terms of green. Going to happen is that the molecules are going to be very tightly packed together. Now, not to bore you too much about chemistry or, or kinetics, but these molecules are constantly moving. They're constantly vib vibrating like this. This is just the natural energy from the cosmos or, or, or whatever term you want to use. So what's what's so what's happening? And I'll I'll kind of uh, I'll I'll kind of uh, zoom in on this here. Is these these molecules are moving? They're moving in all these different directions. And, and what happens is that they are, are going to make contact with another similar molecule. Because this one is also moving. And when they hit, they're going to push each other away. So it's, so it's going to look like this. And they're going to become more, more spread out. Now this is definitely not social distancing approved, but it would be like if I were to, um, um, blindfold 30 people in a, in a, in a classroom, 
and each time you make you made contact with someone, you the only rule was you would have to push them away. Eventually, what would happen is that is that the molecules would, would keep on, on pushing each other until they became evenly distributed in the in the room. So this eventually would look like this. The molecules would be as spread out as possible because randomly they would make contact with each other. They would start to push each other and they would move as far away as possible. There's several examples you can do. You can take some food coloring, put it in a, in a glass of water, and you'll see the particles of the coloring begin to disperse throughout the rest of the, of the solution. Uh, you can also speed this up too by doing something called stirring. You can do something, for example, you can take um, a packet of sugar, put it in your, in your coffee, and after a while, the, the sugar is going to uh, dissolve and be, then become dis distributed throughout the coffee. But normally, we don't want to wait that long, so we, so we uh, stir it to speed it up. And the fusion, as I said, goes down the concentration gradient. The more, the more concentrated the, the particles are, then the faster they will separate because the more tightly packed they are, the more, the more they're, they're going to hit each other and the more they are, are, are going to separate out. So let's go ahead and talk about factors um, that impact the speed of uh, diffusion. And it's on your outline, so I'm not going to cover it too in-depthly. Let me just go ahead and, and embrace this. And the first is going to be distance. So the first factor is going to be distance. So these are factors that affect diffusion. More or less, the greater the, the distance, then the, uh, let me see how to, how to put this. So the, the, the greater the distance, the slower the diffusion rates. To give you an example, this is going to be the alveoli of the lungs, so drawn here, containing oxygen, which I'll draw here in pink. And we'll say that this is going to be the blood. Gases want to get into the blood. Now, in this case here, they're, they're pretty close, but what about if there is uh, pulmonary edema? What if, in, what if, in fact, there is a buildup of, of water between the alveoli and the blood and the, the, the distance that the oxygen needs to move is increased? What's, what's going to happen is it's going to take the oxygen longer to get from the alveoli to the, to the blood. So what's, what's going to happen is that the rates of diffusion is going to go down because the distance has, in, has increased. So the greater the distance, the slower the rate of uh, diffusion. That's why it's really not, not, not good to have the space um, increased because it's going to, to delay the, the rate that oxygen gets in, in, into the blood. Okay, next example here is going to be molecular size, meaning the size of the, of the, the molecules. So size, oops. Here we have the larger the size, the slower the diffusion rate, abbreviated diffusion rate. That's just because large things move slower. Next is temperature. Recall that, that, that temperature usually speeds up activity of things. In this case, the higher the temperature, the higher 
diffusion rate. And of course, with all of these, the inverse is also true. Gradient, as we talked about, the steeper the gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. So the steeper the gradient, the faster the diffusion rate. Next, we have surface area. So surface area is actually the amount of um, surface um, well, to keep it simple, the, uh, the amount of surface uh, area on a cell where things, things can enter and leave. No, that isn't the best, best definition right now, but surface area is the amount of space available on the surface of an environment. And the greater the surface area, the greater the diffusion rate, because there's more places for the molecule to diffuse through. Uh, and you'll, you, you'll see here on the bottom of the outline something says os versus osmosis. Keep in mind that os osmosis is H2O movement in the presence of non-penetrating solutes. Non penetrating solutes. So in that example, the solutes don't don't move so much, so the water has to, because there's a a difference in the concentration of solutes between one environment to the other. Water has to move. Diffusion though is movement of specific solutes from one environment to the other. Yes, so that also reminds me with osmosis, the solutes do not matter, just the osmolarity of each environment. With diffusion, the amount of a specific solute on one side or the other determines how much that that solute moves so for example if you are, are if you are going to try 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 to measure the diffusion rate of sodium you are going to compare the amount of sodium on each side of the cell if you are going to measure the rate of uh, glucose transport you're only concerned with the uh, with the amount of glucose on each side of the cell so it is solute specific with diffusion where with os osmosis the solutes do not matter, just the difference of non-penetrating solutes on each side. All right, we'll be going over more examples of this later on. So I'm going to pause here and then we will continue next with what we call facilitated diffusion.